I just want to make some comments on some comments that have been made about my last couple of videos, and I really appreciate the uh, response videos that have been made by uh, Luke Taylor and uh, Pyro. Um, when I'm sort of pointing out the sort of oblique implication of what Jordan Peterson has to say, i.e. that he is ultimately arguing for a group, a type of groupthink, uh, a type of collective known as Western civilization, where he kind of calls upon Western individuals to restrain the exercise of their human rights um, voluntarily um, in the name of Western civilization remaining strong to deal with its competitors. This is a very interesting point because what he is doing is he's saying in the name of individuality we must act collectively. Pyro mentioned the, and he picked up on something here. I think he did in my video. I'm a liberal. In fact, I'm probably accurately characterized as far left. Um, however, what does that actually mean? Well, in my case, it means that's just my personal inclinations are always on the far left, but I really want to avoid a polarized society. Um, in my youth, I was really fascinated by the Spanish anarchists during the Spanish Civil War, but they were so violent and so stark in their view that they kind of dug their own graves, as it were. Even though they accomplished a lot, the, the violence of it and the, the black-white thinking that they have kind of did them for me. You know, like, it's like, yeah, I, this is not for me, thank you. Maybe I'm into the, the ideas that they espouse, but when you look at the problems involved in trying to get that to work on the ground, Mystic of the Sands refers to policy here, you see the problems, right? So I am kind of an anarcho-syndicalist, I guess, by inclination. Um, I would like to sort of debate the, the whole issue. I'd like to see who would go along with it, etc. I certainly don't see it as an idea to push, to sort of try and sell society on. Uh, to have, I don't have an agenda to impose this or, or install this kind of non-polity, I guess, on my society. Um, I just appraise the, or appraise the situation and say, this is not going to happen in my lifetime, but that doesn't mean that I abandon the idea. Um, and one of the reasons why I sort of think that's not going to happen is the amount of resistance to it that it will provoke. If I sort of say, I want an anarcho-syndicalist, um, non-state to become sort of the way of things in Canada, uh, there's an awful lot of Canadians that are going to have to s have something to say about that. They're not going to want it, and they're going to vehemently oppose what I'm doing. Having said that, it's not the same thing as um, me actually pushing it, nor does it mean that I have to abandon it. It's not a question of policy. It's a question of preference. Secondly, Pyro points out that, I, in a sense, I'm really trying to meet conservatives halfway here. Um, I look at even, like, say, the alt-right, and I say, okay, I understand why some otherwise sane people would kind of, at least their ears would prick up when they hear things that the alt-right have to say. I mentioned um, the obvious. Um, the demographic revolution now taking place in the United States, um, which may actually have provoked a counter-revolution, uh, a counter-demographic revolution. Now, lots of societies have seen this before. In, uh, when, when Canada was born as a country, it had a French-speaking majority. The immigrants that came into Canada, however, because the French are not really, at the end of the day, the sort of people to go and immigrate to another country. Um, the English are, the Irish are. Um, the immigrants that came to Canada were overwhelmingly Anglophone, or they assimilated as such, as English speakers. So this was a demographic threat to French Canadians. So French Canadians then came up with something called la revanche des berceaux, 
it was sort of calculated natalism. It's called, it, it translates as the revenge of the cradle. Fine, you get, you conquer us, English people, and you bring all these immigrants in to sort of make us a minority in the country that was ours until you conquered it. So that's fine. We're going to have 25 kids each. Now, right now, there's something along the lines of 8 million French Canadians. These people are, by and large, descended of 60,000 people that existed in Canada at the time of the conquest of New France, around about 1750-ish. Um, it's amazing what the French Canadians have done to keep the French pres presence in Canada strong, and it is strong. It's just one of the fundamental realities of, of Canada. Now, here we have a case of two responses to demographics. The English may have assumed that sooner or later the French Canadians were going to be assimilated into this gigantic mass of English speakers in North America. And they may have sort of planned the future of the country, the future of all the colonies in point of fact, because um, around about 750, uh, 7, 1750, when English, um, when the British took over New France, um, they still ruled all the 13 colonies and all, all of North, well, big chunks of North America. So the French were a minority, so they just assumed that uh, they were going to eventually steamroll the French minority and make them into English speakers. That's a demographic threat to the English Canadian, to the French Canadians, rather. The French Canadians responded by saying, fine, we'll start churning out babies like it's nobody's business. And that in itself was seen as a demographic threat from the English Canadians. So there was something of a demographic war going on, if one must uh, see it in those terms, although it was never really a shooting war, it was just sort of a grumbling kind of war. Um, English-French tension in Canada is one of the defining things of, of Canadian society, but it's not like Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland or Serbs and Croats in Bosnia. It, it, it's political and sort of public, but on a in, you know personal basis, there's no real issue, no real tension between the people. Um, there are probably exceptions to this, but uh, by and large, no, it's not. It's, a, it's all in the family. Um, but it was what you might call a demographic threat. Throughout Canadian history, people were playing demographic games with each other. Now, to go back to the original point, Trump, or Trump's America, seems to be sort of engaging in some sort of demographic war or demographic struggle. A peaceful one, of course, a peaceful one. And I think white America is struggling for a way to maintain its, not its dominance, but its stamp on America without having to be harsh about it. How can we sort of maintain the white facade of the United States without harming everybody else? Now, I'm giving white America the benefit of the doubt here, and it's simply because I've met too many decent Americans who have nothing against black people or whatever, um, and they don't want to bring back Jim Crow regardless of what everybody is saying. It's like the whole idea is kind of ridiculous. Um, so, yes, maybe white America wants to keep America, by and large, on a general basis, white. Okay. Is that racism? I'm not going to say that it is. It could be so argued, and I'm sure in a lot of people's minds, it is racist, um, and not just, say, people of color, non-white people. Um, people who are out-and-out -out racist white people might be promoting a racist agenda as they attempt to keep America white type thing. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody who wants America to keep its fundamental character as a country that's by and large European in its origins or in its overall feel or white American in its overall feel. It's not the same thing as somebody who wants to actually subjugate, harm, or otherwise exclude non-white Americans. I think most Americans are libertarians at heart, and they don't really give a damn what the next guy gets up to, and they're not really terribly worried about, you know, walking down the street and seeing black people or seeing Asian people or whatever. It's, it's so. 
Um, that's the way the United States and to a certain extent Canada have always been. Um, so I don't think that it's racist per se to want to sort of to have opinions on what the demographics of your country should be. Nor is it necessarily non-racist for someone to want to encourage a demographic tipping point to take place. Somebody might sort of honestly believe, and I kind of fall into this camp, that it might be better off if nobody is the majority here. And arguably, I'm sort of um, leading the charge in that way, in that my kid is not white. He looks a lot more Asian than he does Caucasian. Um, so I don't really have a problem with Canada, I'm a Canadian, uh, becoming, I don't know, be a more of a mosaic than it is now. In other words, a lot more diversity. Um, I don't think that that's a bad thing. And in point of fact, I would probably, in a visceral sort of sense, welcome the day when that would come. Now, is that racist, though? Do I, am, am I therefore a self-hating white person because I do this? I don't think I am. I think I'm simply somebody who doesn't really, increasingly doesn't identify as white anymore. But I, I listen to what white people have to say. So, I, you know, I'm kind of straddling the divide here. Um, Mystic again said, yeah, how about mixed race people? Well, I'm dealing with that in my own life, right? But again, just because I'm sort of moving in the direction of I don't know, but if we have to use terms like multiculturalism, okay. I am moving in that general direction in my own personal life, and I would like to see a world in which my son doesn't have to worry about being called racist things when he grows up. Um, and I like that. Does, that. does this make me a racist, though, because I'm kind of looking forward to the demographics of my country changing and it's a lot more diverse? No, I, it doesn't make me a racist. However, some people might actually be looking at a demographic revolution in order to stick it to whitey, in order to sort of declaw what they believe uh, is the white stranglehold on American society. Um, or even, they might even be punitive about it. Ah, how do you like it now, eh? Huh? How do you like it being a, being a minority, eh? Not nice, is it? Yeah, see all the shit you put us through? That, to me, is also very, very puny thinking. I, I don't feel that way at all. I, I don't see a demographic revolution as somehow Whitey getting his just desserts, and I doubt that 90% of Americans who kind of feel the way I do, who think that sort of a, a rainbow society or a mosaic society is more, it's something they might more prefer to live in. Um, but either one could be argued to be racist, trying to deliberately alter the demographics of Canadian society, which in a sense I am doing, or trying to maintain the demographics of Canadian society. Which is it? If I want to change the demographics of society in order to make it more diverse, am I being a racist? If I want to interfere in the demographic development of my country in order to keep it as, keep the, the demographics the way they are now, does that make me a racist? Arguably both are, arguably neither are. It all depends on whether or not you believe what the other person is saying. Are they, do they have a hidden agenda here, or are they actually just um, are they actually just saying what they honestly believe is preferable in their own life? Both, I think, can be taken as threats. Now, again, this is Trump and Trumpism, which I'm using just sort of as a metaphor for. Um, Jordan Peterson. I'm not saying Jordan Peterson is a Nazi. I'm not saying that he's a racist. I'm not saying he's alt-right or anything like that. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to put some pretty subtle objections to what he's saying in a way that doesn't necessarily alienate people on the right wing. I'm trying to sort of understand what makes people on the right feel this way. Um, what makes people on the right feel that in, uh, that the, de the coming demographic revolution is a threat. I want to see why do you feel this way? And, and it doesn't automatically mean you're a racist. I want to see why Jordan Peterson feels that, what, that Western civilization has to protect itself from contamination by other civilizations, because that is heavily implicit in what he's saying. It's not, it's not a white thing. It's a Western civilization thing, in his view, if you ask me. 
He's sort of saying that culture is that culture is good, that culture is to be maintained, that Western culture is good, and it is to it is to be maintained because it has value, and it has value that other cultures and civilizations and peoples and whatever eras don't have. Um, I disagree with that, but I understand why somebody might agree with it, and I'm I'm not into just denouncing these people um, who feel this way, who sort of think well. As a general rule, marriage should be one man, one one woman. That's just sort of the, maybe that's the zeitgeist that we should have. I would argue that, no, it's not the zeitgeist that we should have. It's the zeitgeist that we will have, and it always will be this way. Um, it's not that I think that it's natural for human beings to be um, one way or another, but I'm saying that probably most human beings want to live just because of the, this is the nature of humans, at least at the present time and under present conditions, to live in more or less monogamous male-female liaisons. I say that, I'm not saying that this is something we should promote. I'm just saying that it's just, this is what we can expect in, in today's world, um, just due to the realities of, of the way humans are. In this sense, I can actually sit down and talk to somebody like Jordan Peterson or one of his followers, and I can say, okay, I get what you're saying, but what I'm saying is it's not... This isn't a conflict with other demographics. It's not a conflict with other worldviews. It's not a conflict with other things. Um, Western civilization can coexist extremely well with other civilizations while remaining Western civilization, and while other civilizations remain 100% themselves. My favorite example of this is India. There are few cultures on Earth and few mindsets on Earth that are more different than the Indian one to the Western point of view. Um, a lot of people who have noted this. My, my slightly rednecky cousin who came along with me when I went to India last January said, Andy, would you say it's true that um, the Indians are the most different from us on Earth? And I'd say yes. Maybe the Aboriginal Canadians might also be, or Aboriginal Americans might fit that mold as well. But the interesting thing about both cases is the people of the Indian subcontinent, and I should include all of them, the, the Pakistanis, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankans and that, they're different from us, but our cultures are complementary. Our, our cultures are not in a state of competition with each other. Perhaps there's a rivalry there, but not a deadly one. It's kind of like the English-French thing in Canada. We are rivals. It's like sibling rivalry between English and French in Canada. But at the end of the day, we're all the same family here, or we like what we see when we look at each other. And I would say that is that definitely characterizes the feel between, say, Western civilization and South Asian civilization. Very different, massive cultural gap. But on a person-to-person -person basis, when... European and Indian meet, they like what they see, however other each one might consider the other one. Uh, same thing with, I find, Aboriginal Canadians and Canadians in general. Big problems, very vast cultural and psychological gap, but by and large, when each one looks at the other, they like what they see. I'm not saying that, 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 that open-minded white people would walk down the street saying, oh, yes, I understand completely why the, that guy is laying in the gutter drunk out of his mind and it's not his fault and this kind of thing. No, it's nowhere near that simple. But he's probably, this said white Canadian who sees a drunk Aboriginal laying in the gutter in, in a Canadian city isn't going to say, somebody's got to start getting tough with these people. No, it, 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 that is almost absent, I find, in the, in the Canadian discourse. And chances are, if he meets an Aboriginal Canadian who he clicks with in some sense, even though he might find the person completely different, it's almost like a sense of relief, like, oh, it's good for us to bridge this gap. Uh, it's kind of like the way that, I guess, black and white people interact in the South. You would think that, you know, there's nowhere else on Earth, like in, in the Deep South, where you have black and white people living together in demographic parity like this. They should be at each other's throats. There should be civil war there. If you if you look at the demographics of the deep south of the United States, people are calling for, people are predicting a civil war in Europe. And at, at in in Europe, maybe ten percent of the population are not of the dominant culture in most European culture countries. In the deep south, 
Like when you get a, a state, say, like Mississippi, it's almost 50-50. It's almost an even split between black and white. And yet there's not a huge race war going on there. Um, there's a lot of tension, a lot of problems. But considering how things could be, um, I think that the South is doing a very good job of managing race relations. I know that's a crazy thing to say, especially from somebody like me, who is supposedly, you know, on the, on the far left and all that kind of thing. But I would say that because of level-headedness on both sides of the racial divide in the United States, in the Deep South, um, and the fact that when you see how white and black Americans interact with each other there on a person-to-person -person basis, in fact, they're quite easy and, and free with each other. They get along a lot. There's a lot less tension um, in the Deep South on an individual basis between white and black people than there is even in, in Canada on an, on an individual basis between white and black people. Because in the States, they kind of know that they may have a problem here that they've got to navigate in the Deep South. Um, so this is the way I would look at it. You can actually coexist with worldviews that are completely different from your own if you actually show goodwill, if you don't frame it in terms of a conflict or a competition. But if you do, then uh, you're actually daring the other guy to see it exactly that way. Jordan Peterson frames this as a competition, a conflict, a collision. I don't see it that way. I don't see other civilizations as a menace to Western civilization. As I say, I see symbiotic situations like you see in the Indian subcontinent, and I go, that's what I want in the future. Maybe I don't want the poverty and filth of India, but I do want to see very different people getting along with each other and negotiating with each other and actually liking each other. I'll, I'll take that to the bank. South Asian people and European people, when they interact, they like what they see, however different they are from each other. They like each other. Um, the final point I'd like to make is Pyro seems to have gotten the idea, and, and uh, this is kind of a danger in what I'm saying, that I am a rugged individualist. I'm not. <laughs> I'm an individual in my own life, but I still vote for parties that, uh, that um, promise universal health care in Canada. I'm still um, pro-gun control. Um, I'm still, uh, I support, generally speaking, um, certain aspects of, say, hate speech legislation. Um, that kind of thing. I strongly support Canada's welfare state, all that kind of thing. It's not that I'm opposed to collectives or collectivities or collectivism even. I just like to point out that Jordan Peterson, while denouncing collectivism, is actually doing so um, simultaneous to creating a collective to get together to fight collectivism. That's all. It's not that I'm against collectivism, and it's not that I'm against libertarianism. I'm just sort of, these are isms, right? And isms mean collectivities. Um, one of the reasons, again, that I think that, uh, that anarcho-syndicalism will never actually happen it's because if there's one person that opposes it, we could have something along the lines of a civil war or whatever, so much for, for um, human freedom when 99.999% of the population is just imposing its will on the dissenting 0.001% of the population. You're going to have people who oppose the idea of having an anarcho-syndicalist society. What are you going to do about that? Well, then we just treat them as a they. No, 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 no. They, uh, doesn't work like that in my world. Again, that's the mistake the Spanish anarchists made. They killed people who actually were not going to be converted to anarchism. Um, to me, that's a ridiculous idea. Uh, anarchism is a point of view. It's, a, it's a, an outlook. I guess you could make policy out of it, but look what happens when you try to do that. Um, this video has turned into yet another ramble. Maybe this is a sign that I probably have a lot more to say on this. Uh, perhaps I should start making more but shorter videos. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who made it this far.